Good afternoon. Are you sleepy and weary after lunch? You okay? Okay. Not even awake enough to respond, huh? Okay. It's okay. It's okay. I believe that uh, God will let this time pass also. <laughs> That's part of grace. Okay, uh, we are continuing with our cell group book, our Bible study book, and we are at lesson 23, the work of the judges. Here it says, the st today's lesson examines the ministries and characteristics of judges Gideon, Tola, Jair, and Jephthah. During our IMW, thankfully, Evangelist Joanna went through these judges. So I trust, I trust that you remember every bit of it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, that's great faith. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll, we'll go through this uh, really quickly, and then we're going to focus a little bit more on Gideon today. So Gideon, his name means woodcutter, lumberjack, and warrior. The judge who saved Israel from the seven-year oppression of the Midianites. Gideon was called a valiant warrior by God, although we know him as a coward, right? So we're going to think about the, the process of change from coward to valiant warrior today, later. Gideon carried out a religious reformation, and Gideon selected 300 warriors. Actually, God gave him 300 warriors to fight against the 135,000 Midianite soldiers. And how did God make that impossibility, mission impossible, possible? Uh, and Gideon triumphed in battle using trumpets and torches. And this is very similar to our uh, earlier message because trumpets appear. And so the army of 300 men defeated 135,000 with holy trumpets and torches because they re relied completely upon God and the 300 warriors obeyed in unity. May Zion Church become the spiritual 300 warriors. And how great would it be? And let us pray that we will have at least 300 people in the church too. People of faith. Uh, Gideon's 300 warriors were exhausted but continued to pursue the, to the end and completed their mission. Next is Tola. His name means warm or maggot. We have been uh, studying here and there a little bit, of, uh, especially our uh, Timothy and Elijah have studied a little bit about judges. And I think we are going to, we are, after our Ezekiel studies for our dawn services, we might enter into uh, the uh, a series on the judges. So you can uh, come to our dawn service to find out more about judges. And so tola means warm or maggot. All these judges were weak, frail human beings that God used to show his power of salvation. Tola saved Israel. Tola felt righteous indignation because of Abimelech's or Gideon's son's tyranny. Okay, so, but uh, Judges chapter 10, verse 1, Now after Abimelech died, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, arose to save Israel, and he lived in Shamir, in the hill country of Ephraim. Tola was buried in Shamir, in the, end, in the land of Ephraim. Tola was from the tribe of Issachar, right? And this was, uh, uh, he, however, he, he was buried in the land of the tribe of Ephraim, located in the central part of Canaan. This was because he reigned in Shamir, where God had sent him to minister for 23 years and did not leave until the last day of his life. Jair, uh, his name is Enlightener, the one who shines light, a uh, contemporary prophet with Tola in different region. Jair judged Israel for 22 years in peace. It was a time of continuous peace with no Gentile oppression. Jair enjoyed riches and honor, and even his descendants received blessings. This shows us a couple of things. 
when, when people were doing God's work and representing God in, and speaking the word of God and bringing peace to the nation, God blesses them and their descendants. But we see even from the judges that it is very easy to abuse or use those blessings for myself, which is a, a very dangerous thing. So uh, Jair had 30 sons, and they rode 30 donkeys and possessed 30 cities. These cities are, were called Havoth Jair, meaning towns of Jair, and provide proof that blessings were extended to Jair's descendants. Jair was buried in Kamon, mean, which means a high place, just as Hezekiah was buried in a high place. Jair's burial was an indication of the people's respect and their desire to honor him throughout the generations. And then we have Jephthah, whose name means he will open it up. God will open it up. Jephthah saved his people from the oppression of the Philistines and Ammonites. Jephthah's emergence was a result of God's plan to save Israel after they had earnestly repented. And God could bear their misery no longer and saved Israel from Ammonite oppression through Jephthah. Jephthah viewed the nation and history of the, uh, through the eyes of faith. Though Jephthah was the son of a harlot and dwelt with worth, worthless fellows in Tob, he guided them in faith. Furthermore, he refuted the Ammonites' request with his insightful understanding of Israel's history with Ammon. But Jephthah made a hasty vow. We, under, we know that he made a vow to offer up a burnt offering, whatever comes out first out of his house to meet him. Uh, he thought it would most likely be an animal, but he, his daughter ran out first. And his daughter is the only one and only child. So... Jephthah triumphed in battle against the tribe of Ephraim. So please do, uh, I, I said this uh, before, the stories of judges, I think some of these Korean drama companies need to take these stories and make them into, uh, I don't know, Netflix drama series. It'd be so fun. So much drama, so much, there's love, there's fight, there's... <laughs> Yeah, so, so if you are ever bored, go to the book of Judges and read through these. And, or come to dawn service. There's going to be drama and dawn service. <laughs> but let us go back to Gideon. And uh, I mentioned earlier that Gideon, we uh, know him as a, a coward, a, a cowardly person that God used to destroy the Midianites. But... I think there is, uh, there is actually more to Gideon and his, the, the, the background uh, that we need to understand. Before, we only think about the, the battle itself. But let us think about, today we're going to only think about the background, how God calls Gideon. And I, I hope that we can relate our, our faith and our situation to Gideon's. And then, I don't call Gideon a... Uh, uh, coward anymore after studying this. So, what happens? Verse 1. This is Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. This is right after Deborah. After Judge Deborah ruled the country in peace for 40 years, 40 long years they were in peace without invasion, without attacks from other uh, tribes or nations. So they were in peace, but once again, as we see, repetition. When they come into peace, their life is comfortable, things are going well, they sin against God again. And so I almost want to say we instead of they, because this really represents us. When we are in in good days and comfortable, things are going well. It seems 
we try to do, focus more on myself. Do what is right in my own eyes. The power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. So this, it was short seven years, seven years compared to other times when they were under oppression for 40 years or 18 years. Seven years is not so long, but then the intensity of oppression was much greater to a point where they're hiding, they're living in, in hiding. They found caves and holes to hide away from the, the Midianites because the Midianites would take everything, crush their, their uh, harvest and everything. Uh, verse 3, 4, it was when Israel had sown the, that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no susten sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. We, they're trying their best to, to make their living. And they come even take away the little that they are trying to earn and, and grow. Can you, do, you, do, you, do you understand or have you experienced? You're trying your best to keep up your faith. But every time Satan comes and little faith that you have trying to grow, he wipes it away. He tramples over it. Every time darkness comes over, Greater darkness, well, I, I receive a little bit of grace, and then there's greater darkness. A little bit, I try to receive a little bit more grace and blessing to overcome that darkness, and then they come even in greater size. Are you going through that? Amen? <laughs> no amen. No man. So, for they would come up, verse 5, with their livestock and tents, they would come up, come in like locusts for number. Right? Both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. Now it came about when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian. See, they weren't crying to the Lord. They weren't praying to God when things were comfortable. And now God said, sent Midian, Midianites and they woke up. Right? And they're now cry, uh, crying, meaning praying to the Lord. That the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel and said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of, from the house of slavery. So God is now speaking through the prophet, not a judge. He sent a special prophet to speak his words. And he said, I am the Lord that brought you out of Egypt, remember? You are here living comfortably because my blessings. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them from before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. So God said, I am the Lord that have brought you here. And so we need to remember why we are here. Who brought me to this place? Who brought me? Who, who protected me so far? But then... Who am I fearing now? Who am I fearing? What am I fearing? My fear, is it, is it the finances? My fear, is it my health? My fear, is it my, my kids? My parents? What is my fear? What's agonizing me? What's keeping me from really believing in God peacefully? And we blame it on the situations. We blame it on the business circumstances. We blame it on our husbands or wives or children. We blame it on our bosses. And that's, that's what's happening. They're supposed to be in peace, but they're not. And they don't know the, the reason why. 
Are you in peace in believing in God? Raise your hand, both your hand and feet, if you are in complete peace in believing in God right now. Okay, none of you. <laughs> none of us. And we always think, oh man, why is it so hard to believe? Why is it so hard to live in this country or in this world? Why is it so hard? Why are there so many people trying to attack me? And so we try to look for reasons why I cannot have peace in other things, in the Midianites. But God says, do not fear them. This word fear is revering. When you fear in the way that you revere, you, that thing that you fear becomes the object of worship. So fear of God causes us to worship God. But God is saying, you fear them more than you fear me. And that's why you're worshiping them. That's why you're entangled with their, their uh, situations and problems that they give you. And he says, but you have not obeyed me. Oftentimes, we know our problems, we know our issues, and, but it's so difficult to come to God. Why? Because we know it so well. You know, if you come to the pastor, you know what he's going to say. And you know you're not, you're not going to like it. You say, I right, skip that. You know, we know the right answer, but is that right answer is too boring now. We've been there, we've done that. And so we are caught in this vicious cycle you know, one day I'm happy and bright. One day I'm down and sad and dark and you know, about to kill somebody or kill myself. And we live that up and down, up and down, schizophrenic spiritual life. And that's when God, the Lord, visits him, visits Gideon. Here, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, as his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. Now, when you are threshing, you are beating uh, uh, the wheat, we learn from the IMW. Pastor Andrew had the picture. It has to be on a plateau, uh, open space where the wind can blow away the shaft and the, your, your threshing and the grain can remain. There has to be some space for the wind to pass. But usually wine press is like a, a little, little hole on the ground where there is no wind. Gideon was doing that because he was afraid that the Midianites would take away his, his grain. His harvest. So that's why we call him a coward. What would you call him? What would we call him in today's situation? He's trying his best not to lose his grain. Although it is much harder to do, he's doing it. Well, what would you say instead of coward? I would say yeah, Spit out the words, coward. <laughs> Gyasu. <laughs> Gyasu. Uh, I would say practical or maybe even smart. He's trying to save his family or save, save this earning and because he knows if he does it in the open, that would be foolish because Midianites would take it away. Anyway, he was doing that because he was afraid of the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now, if you were Gideon, in this situation, what would you tell the angel of the Lord? Oh, valiant warrior. What are you doing right now? You're so afraid of the Midianites. You're hiding and you're, you're supposed to be open, big field, threshing, but you're doing it in this little hole. And you're contemplating, you're probably grumbling, what, what's going on with my life? I have to do this. It's hard. 
It's difficult. How long? And the angel of the Lord comes and says, Oh, valiant warrior. What, what, what's your response? No, try not to use bad words here. I know, I know you're thinking. Yeah. But what would, you, what would you say? A lot of you are just laughing. <laughs> Why? You're, who sent you? You're angel of the Lord? Lo, the, the Lord is supposed to know my situation. You're supposed to cry with me. You're supposed to agonize with me. You're supposed to understand my situation, what I'm going through. But you sound like you don't know anything. You call me o v a l i a n warrior. Oh, happy you are. Because you don't know anything. That's what I would say. What I would have said. Right? I'm going through all this... These worries and burdens on my shoulders, and he comes and says, Oh, valiant warrior. Yeah, right. <laughs> you don't know the fear that I have in me. You know, I have all these doubts, and I'm still barely coming to church. And somebody comes at, at, to you, pastor comes to you, and says, You are a great man or woman of faith. You're probably laughing inside. <laughs> you don't know what I'm going through, <laughs> you don't know what I'm saying. But God, God, angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now, hear what Gideon says. Verse 13. Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Wow. So is he, is he a coward? The way he's t- talking to God, he's not a coward. Right? He says he, he had it piled up in his heart. You know, one day when God, I, I meet God or angel of God, I'm going to say this to him. And immediately he says, Oh, my Lord, good thing you came to me. If, you, if, if the Lord is with, really with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our father has told us about? See, our mom and dad believe well because they experience something. I don't see anything. Right? I cannot believe like my mom and dad. Right? They forced me to come to church, so I come, but then I don't, I don't experience that miracle. Right? Our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? I wasn't there, remember? I wasn't born. But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. What I'm experiencing is the bad things only. All the great things our parents tell us about, I don't experience it. I don't see it. So give me a miracle. Show me a miracle. Then I'll I'll believe you when you call me a valiant warrior. How about us? God, show, show, show me something. Make my business do well. Or, you know, change my kids. (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean, change my kids' uh, attitudes and problems. <laughs> Take away my parents. I mean, I mean uh, <laughs> Lord, do something that I can experience. I can, I can kind of uh, understand that you are still here with me. The only thing I experience is negative things. We all have, I think we all can kind of relate to this. We hear good things. We hear stories. We hear biblical stories, miracles, signs. We hear from our forefathers of faith, amazing things that God has done, our Father has done. But then it seems like it's just, they're just stories. And I don't really see that in my life, my life. actual life, Monday through Saturday, or even Sunday to to Saturday. But what does the Lord say? Verse 14, the Lord looked at him. (laughs) Can you imagine? He's like, he's "Ah!" (laughs) to the Lord, and the Lord is just looking at him and said, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. What? 
And he says, have I not sent you? What would your response be? God, I've been talking to you now or just now. Were you listening? I'm telling you, I got this whole bunch of problems and I cannot go. You solve this problem, then I'll go. But isn't this so much like the God that we know? He says, no, just go. <laughs> Comedy. So just go. Go in this, your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Gideon. What do we see here? What's Gideon's problem? Let's go back to 11 and 12. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash. Uh, come down to verse 12. Uh, sorry, verse 13. Look at what Gideon says. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, Why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. What's his focus? What's his focus? Me. If God is nice to me, then I'm nice to God. I am the focus. If I feel good, good. If I don't feel good, bad. Right? And this is exact representation of people did what was right in their own eyes. My, I am the center of the whole world. And God is supposed to cater to me and serve me and make me happy. Then I can believe in God. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but see, this is where Gideon begins from. But then later we know the story of the battle. When he breaks the jar and let the fire, the, 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 the torch fire be seen, what does he say? For Gideon and for the Lord. His focus is the Lord when he's fighting. So how does that change? Right? For us, we, you probably kind of related to me when I was speaking on behalf of Gideon, talking about my situation, my problems, My circumstances. If we stand, put ourselves as the center of this argument, that makes sense. But God says, God takes him out of that self-centeredness and says, go, just go. And sometimes the solution is that. Why? If we continue to stay in, uh, where I am the center, We will never, even when God shows us miracles and signs, it will only be for that moment. It will never convince me. I will never be convinced. We cannot ever do God's work by waiting for miracles to be shown to us, waiting for our problems to be solved. It is when we go, then those problems will be solved. Then God will do miracles. Do you see the difference in the order? God's, God's giving him. It's not that God wasn't listening to him. God's giving him solution. Go save Israel. Go forward. And I believe that a lot of our church members have experienced this. We're not ready. We don't have enough. I still have problems. But the Lord says, God says, go. Do my work. You do, we go and do our work. It does, it's not necessarily the problem goes away right away. But we go, we live, we go forward. Just a little bit more, is that okay? okay. So he said to him, verse 15, Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. He realizes, I, am the, I, I have nothing. I am not able. But the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. See? He says, not because you are all that. Not because you don't have problems. But you will be able to do this work because I will be with you. May our Lord be with you. Then you can do anything that will please the Lord. You shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, 
If I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak, who speak with me. Here, do we see a doubting Gideon? I want to, I want to ask you to look at it in a uh, different perspective. It seems like he ha- he, he's still doubting. But he's making sure this word is not coming from something else or some other spirit. He wants to make sure this is really from God. Right? What's he doing? He's communicating with God. I believe that's what we need to do. We need to learn to communicate with God moment by moment, every time. God, is this what you want me to do? Is this really you? Right? We need to check. Sometimes, and God really loves that. Because when David stopped doing that, God was upset. Right? So he's checking. And please do not depart, depart from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain until you return. So the angel of the Lord remains until Gideon brings what seems like a burnt offering. And the Lord consumes it. He doesn't, the angel doesn't eat it, but the fire comes down and the Lord consumes it. Gideon, verse 22, when Gideon saw that he was the, that he was the angel of the, of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He tests God, but in return, in every time in the Bible, someone tests God, and God proves himself to that person, they humble themselves and they're ready to obey whatever God says. Are we ready to do that? And then he says, verse 23, The Lord said to him, Peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Wow. This is when peace comes. All that oppression, all those worries, all these things. Gideon was waiting for God to give him peace. And this is the way he does it. The, because when we confirm the one that we, I have met, the word that I have received is from God, that's when peace comes. Gideon's problem still, the Midianites are still there, but Gideon received that peace. May we receive that peace in living our life of faith. There are still issues and problems in this world, but it's completely different when I have peace in our heart versus when I don't. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it, The Lord is Peace, Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. We'll, we'll stop here. Uh, I'll say one more thing as a conclusion. Uh, this story goes on. God now tests this cowardly Gideon, and he says, Destroy the great statue of Baal and Asherah in your father's house, in your dad's house. And Gideon does it. And then, now Gideon gathers all these people to go out to fight. Right? How many people does he gather? 32,000 people volunteer to come go fight with Gideon. After he gathered, then he asks God, God, can I test you one more time? You, mean, you remember the fleece test? Right? First is possible, you know, what well, it's the first. The ground is wet, but the fleece is not wet. And second, impossible. Fleece wet, the ground not wet. Anyway, he does that test. But think about this. It's not logical. If he was going to test God, he should have tested him before he gathered the 32,000 people. He told the, these people, we're going to go fight against the Midianites. The Lord is with us. The Lord came to me, and the Lord is with us. We're going to go out fight. Everybody volunteer, sign up. And then he tells God, God, are you real? Does this make sense? What is he doing? What's he doing? Let us turn to... Isaiah...
chapter 7. Verses 10 through 12. Isaiah chapter 7, 10 through 12. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep. Make it, make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Right? Asking God is spoken as, described as testing the Lord. Before going out to war, the commander-in-chief comes to the king and receives his blessing before he goes. Oh, king, I'm going to go out now and fight. Are you sure? Do I have your, your, your approval? Do I have a go? I'm, I'm about to take the whole military and go out and fight the enemies. And so the commander-in-chief needs to come to the king and receive his blessing, check with him one more time, report to him, and go. Right? That's what Gideon is doing. Right? Here Ahaz, the evil king, did not want to ask God. He just he wants to do what he thinks is right. What is, from uh, looking at it in a more positive perspective, what is Gideon doing? He's communicating with God every moment. He's not, he's not asking God to, to prove the fleece test because he's doubting anymore. He's asking God, God, is this the right time? Do I go? Right. Verse 13, then he said, listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? So God is unhappy when Ahaz refused to test him. So what does God do? Yeah, he proves to Gideon, yes, go. But, wait, wait, wait. Anybody who's afraid, let them go home. How many people went home? Out of the 32,000, 22,000 went home. How many remaining? 10,000 remaining. Okay, 32,000 Almost impossible against 135,000, <laughs> right? But if God is with us, we can try. But 10,000 against 135,000, what is it? <laughs> Come on, God. Is this a joke? Right? But God, test, God proved himself to him. Now it's his turn to believe. Do you see? We, we ask God to prove himself to us, and now it is my turn to believe him. Okay. And God says, no, 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 not, I'm not finished yet. Okay. Let them kneel down and, and drink water, right? Oh, sorry, 9,700 out of the 10,000 are not ready. Let them go home. How many remaining? 300 against 135,000. Do your math. How many does one soldier have to kill to defeat the Midianites? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a suicide mission. It will not even uh, create a dent on the, the Midianite soldiers. 450, right? 450. One person has to kill 450 people to defeat. <laughs> impossible but Gideon goes out through his interaction with God Gideon found that faith Gideon found meaning in this sometimes when we find true meaning in what we do it doesn't possibility or impossibility it doesn't really matter I'm just happy that I can do God's work and be with him that in itself is a blessing not the result but the result is, none of the 300 died. They defeated the Midianites. Hallelujah. May that blessing, that growth in our faith, come about 
as a fruit of our interaction with God day by day. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to understand what you have done and with Gideon to give him that courage, strength, make him into a valiant warrior. Father, we pray, although we are cowardly like Gideon, that you may come to us and give us that courage also. Father, we are not able, but when you come to us, we believe that you will be able to use us, each and every one of us, to fulfill your amazing work. We believe, Father, that Zion Church is full of valiant warriors. You have called them, you have chosen them, and you are using them. Father, please continue to hold on to them, continue to help them to overcome all their issues and problems. Help us to go forward and help us to glorify you and help us to experience your amazing victory. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Let's give thanks to God.